This is Deepak Chopra, and it's a great delight for me today to have uh, my dear friend, Leonard Mallard now. Uh, he and I have um, argued, agreed, disagreed, and done some fun things together. Leonard is a prolific writer, and his writings are based purely on very good scientific research and thinking. And he has a new book, it's called Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. Once again, the book is Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. It's very intriguing, very insightful, and very informative. And I'm going to uh, be asking Leonard a few questions about the book. And then we may go a little bit off tangent and, and discuss other things, but we'll see. So first of, all, first of all, Leonard, thank you for joining me on this very interesting uh, uh, channel that we have. Uh, we ultimately, over the long term, reach uh, almost 15 million people. I've had the privilege of uh, interviewing some colleagues of yours recently, including um, uh, Caltech professor Sean Carroll, and also uh, you know, Wilczek, Frank Wilczek from, um, from uh, MIT. Uh, very interesting conversations. I think uh, we are at a place in science where uh, more things are being revealed and more questions are being asked at the same time, which is the way science, I guess, uh, progresses. The more we know, the more the unknown looms, more questions we have. But I want to know why you wrote this book, Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. First of all, welcome, and thank you for doing this. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks for inviting me. And I've always loved talking to you, and uh, your show is great, and all, all your interviews are always a pleasure. So happy to be here. Thank you. Go, yeah. You wrote so, this book. How yeah, I? Well, so I, you know, I, about... Uh, a little before I met you, about 15 years ago, I started getting interested in what you're interested in, which is the mind. Uh, I know I'm a physicist, and I had written some books on, on physics and cosmology and so forth. But uh, a good friend of mine, Christoph Koch, whom you also know, was at Caltech and invited me into his lab to observe and to learn. And for years, I attended his research seminars. I took classes. I read uh, hundreds of uh, scientific articles and, and learned about uh, neuroscience and psychology of the mind uh, alongside of, of Christoph, who was, I have to say I'm grateful to, was a big help. And I ended up writing a book, which at one point Christoph and I were going to write together, but, but he pulled out called Subliminal, How Your Unconscious Mind Rules Your Behavior. And I just found that- book, Which was a great book, I read it. Thank you. And I learned a lot from it. I, I enjoyed it, uh, as I hope as much as the readers do and learned a lot about how you know, the some of the hidden forces behind your thoughts and your behavior. And after that, I wrote another, I, I was interested in that, still interested in that field. I wrote a book, Elastic, about where ideas, new ideas come from and creativity. I know it's also a subject you're interested in. And then I, I felt after that, I, I was asking myself, uh, is there anything else that that's going on in your in your mind that is really crucial to understanding your own feelings and decisions and desires and and I realized that that was emotion and I started studying it and I talked to another friend of mine Ralph Adolf also at Caltech and it happens that he's a leading researcher in emotion and his advice to me was don't do it don't write about emotion it's too complicated that the field is just being revolutionized it's crazy it's wild, uh, find something else that's more orderly. And I said, no, <laughs> that's exactly what I'd like to write about. It'll be fun. And so I spent a few years learning uh, all the details of that. And he was very helpful and trying to synthesize the, the, a, a huge field. The field of emotion has really been revolutionized and has exploded in the last 10, 20 years in terms of, of the amount and the quality of the research, a lot of it being due to new uh, experimental imaging techniques and other techniques like, you know, optogenetics and things like that. And uh, it's been amazing. And uh, the questions I wanted to answer in the book are how, you know, like the subtitle says, uh, how, how do emotions influence your thoughts and your feelings and your decisions? And most of us, sometimes we realize that it's happening, but for the most part, we don't really appreciate the 
the role that it plays and that it's a positive role. It's not that emotions get in the way of good decision making. It's that emotions, um, in fact, evolved for good decision making. And then we're feeling emotions all the time, uh, many, many times during the day. It's not just when we lose our temper or get super angry that, that that's an emotional experience that we don't even realize in smaller ways we're experiencing little little um, little experiences of emotion that guide even when I decided say to get out of this chair and get something to eat or drink. Uh, that's it, that that decision, that calculation, mental calculation took place with emotion involved. So every time our the point is that every time you 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 execute what you think is ra logical, rational information processing and thinking, it's not in a vacuum and it is attached to an emotional experience that you're feeling and, and, the, and the process that the, the, the outcome of those mental processes depends on the emotion that's involved and you can't really separate the two. So, um, of course, uh, I started to read your book and uh, last night I was reading the introduction where you talk about your mother and your father who were both uh, Holocaust victims, and you very, uh, very clearly uh, describe the differences in their attitude towards life in general, and their emotional response to life in general. But uh, you also say in the introduction, how that influenced your emotional makeup as you were growing up. Um, say a little bit about that. Well, my so my parents, having gone through the Holocaust, obviously had an amazing, um, a, a large, huge effect on their, on their emotional life and on their thinking in general and the context with which they, they view the world. And so, as, as you know, in many of my books, including the book that you and I wrote together, I tend to draw on their experiences. I mean, they're often so vivid and dramatic. And uh, unfortunately, often they're, they're sad experiences. Sometimes uh, they're they're happy. And uh, I had a, a happy childhood where I felt very supported and loved by my parents. But I was also exposed to certain emotional um, extremes, I would say. And my mother, who lost her, um, her um, father, and her dear sister, and all her friends during the war, reacted uh, with a great deal of um, pessimism and, and anxiety. So you went through life with, full of pessimism and anxiety, always in the background, fearing that the worst could happen. Uh, and it leads to some interesting, funny stories, but they're sad in a way, but uh, they are sad, but, but they show the way that she was thinking. Uh, my father, on the other hand, uh, who lost his um, family also and siblings and his, uh, he had a wife and a child, uh, and, and then he ended up uh, as a resistance fighter and then in the concentration camp. And, and he, he had, in a way, the opposite reaction. He, I remember him as being the optimist and uh, very active and always thinking things would work out. And, and um, he had a different, a different point of view. And they, they had, of course, their experiences were nothing like identical because uh, no two individuals have identical experiences, but, but they had the same uh, general um, um, environment that, 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 that left this horrible, uh, you might call it PTSD uh, on them, but, but they reacted mostly in different ways. And one of the, one of the uh, things I wanted to understand in this book is how that works. Uh, what are emotions in the first place? And why do we people, different people react in different ways? And, and what are the different tendencies that people have toward one emotion or another? And the role of nature versus nurture and all those all those interesting questions um so that you know a part of my interest in emotion came from these rather intense emotional experiences i had as a, a growing up the book is called emotional how feelings shape our thinking leonard mallard now and um, uh, there are very interesting chapters uh, i want to get into them but uh, one, let me ask you a couple of things uh, before i get into uh, the meat of the book, so to speak. So, you know, a long time ago, when I got interested in this field, I did read uh, uh, Charles Darwin's uh, take on emotionals, uh, emotions. Uh, I was surprised that a lot of people were not familiar with Darwin's contribution to uh, why we have emotions. And he said um, in his writings that emotions 
uh, there biologically for the same reason as anything else, survival and adaptation. In his view, anger is the animal's response um, to danger, uh, to fight or flight, uh, as is fear, uh, the response to survive. Um, but he then went on with other emotions. He said jealousy is, is the usurpation of uh, reproductive rights. Uh, nausea is the, is the feeling of uh, 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 the feeling that we get when we say nausea is due to the contamination probably of foods that have danger in them to, or toxicity. Um, and he actually was very convincing that every emotion has a biological function. We have uh, about 43 facial muscles. They reflect uh, over 100 emotions. And at least from what I've learned from evolutionary biology, our reptilian brain is 300 million years, emotional brain uh, in evolutionary time, the emotional brain is um, 100 million years, and the cortical brain, which is the so-called intellectual brain, uh, is actually very young. I mean, you know, developed explosively after we learned language, um, narrative language, and started to tell stories. But if Homo sapiens has been around only for 200,000 years, and written language and oral language have only been around for a few thousand years, then the intellect or rationality, um, which has, uh, it correlates in the frontal cortex and in the cortical brain, um, according to what I've read is, um, all of us pretend, even including scientists, pretend to be creatures of uh, rationality, but we bristle with emotion. And uh, we also bristle with the very basic instinctive survival drives, like feeding and fighting and um, fornicating, if you will, because all those three Fs, feeding, <laughs> fleeing, and fornication, four Fs, are just for survival. So it doesn't matter if you're a Nobel laureate or you know, you're uh, navigating the far reaches of the cosmos with your mind as your colleague Stephen Hawking was doing. But most of the time we are still ruled by our emotions. We are bristling with emotions and our decisions are emotional. And then we rationalize them through what we call reason. Would you think that kind of... Uh, Agree with that? I would kind of kind of agree with that. Uh, let me go into a little more detail of, of, of how I see that, or how I how uh, the, in the uh, literature, the academic literature that I've digested uh, treats that. Um, I, I have a story in the book about Paul Dirac, whom you know very well, uh, mm -hmm. one of the leaders of quantum theory, inventors of quantum theory in the twentieth century, yes. who was uh, considered a genius and a very unemotional fellow and who did amazingly creative uh, work in, in, in influential work in, in physics in the 20th century. And when he was asked later in life, what was his key to his brilliant uh, success as analytical, theoretical, uh, mathematical advances, he said, it was always follow your emotion. <laughs> so I, 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 I tell that story because you, you had mentioned in, in what you just said that, that we think of uh, our, ourselves as doing these very rational uh, calculations and even uh, mental personal calculations, but even scientists, scientific reasoning is being very rational. And it, and it is, but it's not separate from emotion. And here's how emotion works. And we can talk about the evolution, but I uh, understand what you said. And I, I think that that that's the way it's seen today, uh, even uh, the way, I mean, what Darwin, the way Darwin viewed emotion has for the most part been superseded, but this idea that it, that it evolved for a reason is still there. And of course, uh, it, and is a, demanded by his theory of evolution, which has been um, studied and, and confirmed so many times. So, but what, what, why did they evolve? Obviously emotions evolved to, to help animals uh, react properly in, in a way that helps them survive in any given situation. So for example, you mentioned uh, uh, the nausea, uh, that, that's discussed. So 
that's the emotion of disgust. And, and we have, well, we, meaning uh, humans in the wild and animals in the wild, have that that emotion of disgust to protect them from eating things that are that are not good for them. Most animals, I mean, all animals and, and, and humans in the old times that did not live in a world where you go to the grocery store and the FDA has uh, approved whatever they're selling their food and the drugs or whatever. And, 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 and there's recalls, God forbid, if something is contaminated and, and you, you don't have to think about it. In the wild, um, you didn't have enough food. You wanted to eat anything you could. And it was a very big problem if you ate the wrong thing that could uh, that could give you a sickness or destroy your organs or whatever it is, whether it's a bad mushroom or bad meat. And so we had uh, an emotion of disgust to kind of pull us back from those things that evolved to react to those situations. As you said, fear and anger uh, um, evolved to deal with threats. And, and, but but how, how do they work? Well, here's how they work. You're, think of your mind as an information processing machine. Now, I, I'm not saying computer because it's very unlike a computer. It, it's highly, a computer, uh, at least, and the way it's traditionally programmed runs on a very linear path. The programmer says, uh, if A puts in some data and has a bunch of rules, if A then B, if B then C and so forth, and the rules of logic are, are, into the, are programmed into the computer if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C and other rules like that. And, and in the end, the computer grinds through, takes the data, grinds through its, its marching orders, which are the program, and spits out an answer. And we can follow exactly how that works. Uh, the, the human brain is not like that. The, 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 the human brain has, a, has about 100 billion neurons, and they're all highly interconnected through thousands of connections with other neurons. And, and, and these develop their behavior through learning. Uh, you know, there are some preset programs, but a lot of it is, is and most of it is through learning and through experiences that, that you have starting with your infancy and, and becoming through becoming an adult. And it's a little bit like uh, the way computer programmers over just the last few years have started programming with these so-called neural net programs and these deep learning techniques where the computer programmers, instead of telling the machine what to do and how to process the information, they set up the machine in a way uh, with artificial neurons uh, that they program in, and, and they set up a situation where, uh, where the machine tries to uh, achieve a goal and is either, a, 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 and what, depending on whether the goal is achieved or not achieved, the program is, so, so to speak, rewarded or punished, and it evolves its own way of solving the problem. That's called neural net programming or deep learning. And that is so much more powerful than, than the old way. And the computer is not really by its nature built to do that, but we found ways to make the computer do that. But your brain is built to do that. And that, that's how it works. So that's your brain is an information processor, but highly what we call parallel and interconnected and complex. And it does processing with the same rules of logic that the computer has. So if A implies B and B implies C, A implies C. So your brain knows all that and it does it can do rational logical processing, but what is it processing? What is it? What, what sets it going? What is it? What what is it actually? What is the data that's coming in? Well, the data that's coming in to your mind is where emotions enter the 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 the, the, the system. Uh, emotions are a a mental state that determine what what kind of logical processing what is fed into the logical processing. So when you're what are the inputs to your processing? There are your sensory inputs, what you hear, what you see, what you feel and smell, okay? There are also your memories of maybe situations that are similar to the one that you're in now, your beliefs, your goals. All these, all these factors are, have to be set up before your so-called rational processing can start working, okay? And the point of emotion is that the, the, the choice of which memories, beliefs, or senses, sensory input to, to pay attention to, how important to, to value those particular pieces of data, uh, what, what to be skeptical of. All that has to be done before your processing can happen. And your mental emotional state is what determines how that's done. So let me just illustrate with an example, because that was a bit abstract, I think. Um, I'm walking to uh, say to, to meet you uh, in, at a restaurant in, in, in downtown LA. 
And as I'm walking, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm thinking about, well, maybe I'm hungry, what I'm going to eat there. I want to talk to you. I don't want to spend time studying the menu. So I, I'm coming there trying to figure out what am I going to eat? I'll figure that out before I get there. I have to decide what path am I going to take? Do I turn on third street or do I turn on fourth street? How do I cut over to the next street and all these things, right? So, and, and, and sm when I'm in that state, uh, uh, small noises and, and many sights do not register. Uh, sensory things are happening, but they don't register. There might be a, a car putting a screeching or something in the distance and it goes in one ear and out the other. I don't even notice, I wouldn't even remember it. Like when you're at a cocktail party, there's such a noise of things around you, but you obviously, you, your, your mind, your conscious mind doesn't have the bandwidth to process it all. So as it comes in, there's, you, there's selections being made on an unconscious level and your consciousness only, only is aware of some of it. So if your name Deepak Chopra is mentioned, it pops out of the, of the, of the din and, and, and suddenly you, you do hear that, whereas you hadn't heard anything else that person had said. So your unconscious mind realizes that's important and pops it in. Well, when you're walking down the street and you're relaxed and, you're, and, you're, and your hunger is your primary emotion, we call that a homeostatic emotion, an emotion that has to do with your um, survival directly with the bodily function. Uh, that's your state of mind. So you're noticing certain things. You might notice the smell as you walk by a different restaurant and, and that comes into your mind. And, and when you're trying to decide where to turn, you're doing it on the basis of how do I get there fastest so I'll be on time and so forth. Now, suppose you, 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 you hit a, a part of the street where something makes you fearful. Maybe um, you see something or you remember that this street is a high crime street or, or something like that. And, and suddenly you, your emotional state changes to fear. Well, you know what's gonna happen now? You, you'll forget your hunger. You won't even notice your hunger or it'll be greatly diminished. So that input, is is greatly diminished suddenly your your focus on sounds that are happening and sights in your background are amplified so e even a breaking of a twig behind you that you wouldn't have noticed now you're going to notice and put great importance on it you might even turn and look and see what's going on what you're gonna you're gonna calculate your your route to the restaurant differently because your your goal now is to evade a possible predator i'll call it but you know a possible danger in the bad neighborhood and so you're, you know, so in other words, you're in the state of fear, your sensory input that gets to your consciousness is changed. What you think of when you make a so mental associations and your memories that you pull up have changed, your goals change, your emphasis on different things change. And then your processor of your brain, your rational processor goes to work on that. So you'll make a completely different decision given the same circumstances when you're in a fear state than when you're in a hunger state. You know, in the laboratory, we can distill this and we have some very interesting experiments just to, again, to illustrate, uh, let's think of uh, the emotion of disgust. Disgust that we just talked about, it has to do more generally, not just with uh, your reaction to disgust is not just a, a tendency to expel from your mouth, whatever you might've eaten, but it's generally, we, we find that more generally a disgust mental state gives you a tendency to expel things. Okay. So, one, one experiment to, to test this, researchers put subjects in a disgust state by, there's different ways. They had, well, one of them had a fart, someone farting, and there was fart spray, and one of them showed them a really disgusting scene from train spotting and whatnot. So there's different ways they'll put the subjects in a disgust state. And then afterwards, they'll, they'll ask them, they'll ask to buy something off of them. Uh, for example, a pen that they had given them at the beginning of the experiment or, a, or a, a gift, a little gift box of something. And, uh, and then they, they, they compare the, 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 uh, how much money people demand for this item in a control group that didn't get disgusted versus a group that's in a disgust state. And so with the pens, for example, they found that the control group, if, they were, if, the, if the researcher sent someone in to ask to buy that pen back from them, they would demand about four, four and a half dollars, okay? The, the, uh, the group that was in a state of disgust uh, only asked about two and a half dollars. So they're, they're, they're both, this is in a pure laboratory situation, which is pros and cons. It's, 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 it's happening. happening. And of course, the con is it's a rather official situation, but you can see here how the, the mental processing, answering the question, how much is this pen worth to me? 
is different. The same data is there, but it's different when they're in a disgust state versus when they're not in a disgust state. And that's the way each of our emotions work. Each of our emotions is associated with a certain mental state that, that a certain context in which your brain does its rational thinking. As I'm listening to you, uh, I'm thinking that uh, sensations, bodily sensations, sense perceptions, which are the five senses, uh, feelings, emotions, images in the mind from imagination and memory, and thoughts are in a sense entangled and they work together with one purpose, which is biological homeostasis at every level. It's not just hunger, but everything, body temperature or uh, stress or inflammation, um, sensations, images, feelings, thoughts are basically entangled in a way and function in a way through the brain um, to restore biological homeostasis uh, for well-being in a sense and survival. Uh, and as I'm reading now the chapters of your book, you say part one, what is emotion, thought versus feeling. So let me, let me comment on that. Um, thought is an idea. Uh, the idea could be, uh, uh, what's the weather like today? That's the thought. And then I, I check out the weather channel. And it says uh, 32 degrees or uh, New York today, 22 degrees. And then I decide whether I'm going to go out to, uh, you know, buy um, whatever, a hamburger or whatever. Now I start thinking of hamburger, I think of the temperature, I think of how cold it's going to be. I think, do I want to do it? In a way, all my thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, and imagination are all working together cohesively, coherently to help me make that decision. And the difference then between the thought and the emotion or feeling is the thought is a purely mental event. But uh, the feeling is also a sensation at the same time. Long ago, I kind of, when I was looking at this myself, I started to define emotions as thoughts linked to sensations in the body. Uh, would you say that's a good distinction between thought and feeling? Yeah, uh, so emotion is one of the ways that your body communicates with your thinking, right? So. Uh, emotions have a uh, physical uh, component. You, 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 when you're feeling an emotion, uh, for instance, fear, your heart would, might start to race. Uh, your, 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 your sense of smell can, can be um, uh, enhanced and so forth. And uh, your, your emotion, your brain is constantly reading the state of your body and feeding that into the emotion you feel. Uh, so in other words, if you're too hot or too cold, that's getting fed into, into, the, into your emotional state. So the emotions are very much a bridge between your body and, and your mind. Okay, good. So I think um, that's very important for people to recognize um, this little distinction that a thought can be a purely mental event, but a, emotion is a body-mind event at the same time. Um, now you say the purpose of emotion emotion, the evolutionary objective of emotions and how emotions differ in animals ranging from insects to humans. Now, you know, again, I've not kept up to date with this, but I thought emotions are only found in mammals, not in reptiles. The reptiles are purely instinctive and mammals who don't lay eggs, but make babies, nurse their babies, cuddle them, coo, kiss, touch, create uh, family bonds uh, and even play and sing uh, that mammals are emotional, but uh, anything below that level of evolution, you know, is not, you know, you see a, you see a flock of geese or you see a, a line of geese walking and, you know, the mother has a lot of these chicks behind and a predator suddenly swoops and takes up one of the chicks. She looks back and then she continues walking. Whereas the mammal would actually uh, protect the young um, because it's emotionally bonded. 
And but you here say insects to humans. What do you mean? So people used to think that that it was only in the so-called higher animals, but and there uh, probably are some who who I, who still believe that way. Uh, but in general, we found now that that emotions, uh, or at least in a, a big movement in the emotion world, is to realize that emotions are really um, part of, uh, if not all animals, well, animals all even as simple as fruit flies. And so one of the things you have to do to understand or even ask that question in science is to define emotion in a very precise and uh, almost in a quantitative quantitative way. And uh, so there is, I, I talk about one of those definitions, which is a quite a good one, I think, in the book, that, that, that certain um, emotions is a reaction that has certain uh, qualities and under order to understand what that even means you have to look at what is the alternative so let's look at the simplest thing that animals do and that's called reflexive behavior or in humans we could call it scripted behavior or um, fixed action patterns uh, autopilot kind of behavior when you're driving to work let's say or you Deepak are walking to work in, in New York or you're walking to the ABC carpet and you know your route you, you don't even have to think about it you're going to make your turns where you make your turns and uh and suddenly you're there you may not even remember having turned left or right at different places and in fact with me it's a problem when I'm was driving to my old office at Caltech that if I was going somewhere else that had the same start and then I would start thinking about something, my autopilot would take over and I would end up at Caltech, even though I meant to go to the cleaners, you know, but I kind of found myself that I was following that. So that's reflexive thinking. Um, with a bird, for example, you see a goose uh, sitting on a nest and an egg falls out the goose, even though uh, the, the mother might not appear that upset about uh, one of its um, offspring being picked off, the mother will reach her neck out and put the, the egg back in. And it looks like a loving thing that the mother is doing. But that's not actually, uh, well, I don't want to say that's not true. We can't get into the mother's head. But let me just say that if we put a softball next to the nest or a volleyball or a pear or an apple, she'll do the same thing. Anything like that next to her nest, she will bring into the nest. So that's what we might mean by reflexive behavior. It seems that there's a specific trigger. Something's next to the nest and a response. You bring it in. We don't believe there's any thinking or emotion behind that. And those kinds of uh, reflexive behavior um, if you have a big encyclopedia of what to do when, in, in certain situations, you can kind of live your life that way if you live a very simple life. It's maybe not, though not, not the most, not the, most op, not the optimal way to, to survive. And there are more sophisticated ways where you can have more nuanced, subtle reactions such as humans have. And, and that's where emotions come in. So emotions are a, a level between uh, the, the trigger and the response. So if, if this was an emotional goose sitting on the nest, uh, then the, the goose would notice that something uh, was next to the nest and feel, let's say, um, anxiety or love or you know, uh, fear that, that, that one of her uh, offspring that she feels attachment and love for is in, in harm's way. And that feeling will come. And then she will take her reasoning and that feeling together, working together and make a decision about whether to pull this thing back into the nest. So it's a more complex way of reacting. It's, it, and, and it has the ability then to go, oh, something's there that scares me. Uh, I'm, I'm worried. That worries me. Then I, 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 I'm sorry, sorry. I look at it and I see that... Um, that I see that it's not, it's not a, an egg, it's a volleyball. And then my rational thinking says, don't automatically bring it in, just leave it there. So they, they can work together. That's an extra layer. And so these, uh, these kinds of uh, emotions that we feel, they, they, they have certain properties. Uh, uh, for instance, they're, they're, they happen to automate, the, the, the emotion happens automatically. You don't, you don't think about it before you feel it. Uh, you don't will it, it happens. They, they have certain persistence. So if you have, a, if you have fear, I hear something uh, I, and I keep walking, two minutes later, I have some remnant of that fear, even though that stimulus is gone now and nothing happened immediately, but that fear stays. And that has its own evolutionary purpose because if there was something possibly bad behind me, there could be something possibly bad in front of me and it's good to keep my, my guard up. So one of property of emotion is that it has a certain persistence. Uh, it has a valence. It's either it's positive or it's negative and so forth. Scientists have 
found four, five, six, depends who you ask, properties of emotion. And then they go and they say, let's look at fruit flies and other animals and see if, if their behavior seems to exhibit this. And when they, when they test fruit flies, they find that this happens. So for example, fruit flies are very sensitive to a shadow passing through the visual field. So they're just sitting there, let's say, I don't know, eating some sugar water and there's a light above them. And then you, you, you just go like that and make a shadow go. They're going to jump away because to them, a shadow is something coming after them. And, and then they come back eventually and they, and they go back to, to eating. And you can see how far away do they jump, how long do they stay away and so forth. And you can find that, that there is a, there's an effect of the prior scare on their future behavior. In other words, persistence. So they're in a, in a state now, in a hot, more guarded state. The next day they, they, they come back, it takes less to stimulate them to go because they're in a more guarded state. So this, we call fear, whatever it is, is persisting in them, this, this, this state of, of, of processing. The, 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 the earlier event lingers in, in their behavior. And so you can, anyway, you know, in different ways, they do experiments to test the different aspects of the behavior, and they conclude that they're really reacting emotionally. And one of my favorite experiments was, uh, and this is, you, you, this is um, uh, something that I, you know, I, it's, it's interesting for more than just its purely scientific sake, but they, when, when you study fruit fly sexual behavior, the male walks up to the female and they each do certain things, and then the female either accepts it or rejects it. And they found that fruit flies that have just been rejected sexually, if you give them a choice of whether to go in one direction or another, where one of the directions has some booze, <laughs> some, some alcohol, they will, after they've been rejected, they will go more of them, significantly more will go toward the alcohol than, than the other way, uh, based on their having just been rejected sexually. <laughs> so in some ways, I, mean, I don't want to read too much into that. I'm not saying they're trying to, to kill their, 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 uh, uh, their, their pain, but it looks that way. <laughs> but you know, uh, from what I've read, fruit flies um, and humans share about 70% of the same genes. So it doesn't surprise me. Uh, what, and mice uh, share about 80% and, and primates share 98 point something, same percentage, same genes as us. So there's this kind of a unity of life around um, the whole evolutionary ladder. So it doesn't surprise me what you said. Um, I just want to remind my audience that uh, I'm speaking to Leonard Millard now. The book is Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. We could talk about each of these things for a week. So I, we don't have the time. And for us to be on social media, it has to be less than one hour. And I think we are close to 42 minutes. So let me read the chapter headings for our audience. So they know that this book is going to be a treat if they read and we'll give them, uh, uh, it will expand their mind on the role of emotions and the science behind them. Here are the, uh, the chapter headings. Uh, part one, what is emotion? Thought versus feeling and the purpose of emotion. Three, the mind body connection. Part two, pleasure, motivation, inspiration, determination, how emotions guide thought, um, emotions as a mental state that influences our information processing, um, then where feelings come from, how the brain constructs emotion, motivation, wanting versus liking, determination, and then the last uh, part, which I found very interesting is uh, your emotional profile, Assessing which emotions you're made, uh, which emotions you're more inclined to feel, and the manner in which you tend to react to potentially emotional situations. Uh, managing emotions, how to regulate your emotions. And then there's a nice epilogue. So the book is very, very um, exhaustive in its scientific examination of, uh, of uh, why and how we experience emotions and what their biological function is and what their evolutionary origin is as well. So having introduced the uh, audience to, to the main contents here in this book and encouraging them to read the book, in the last five minutes or so, or maybe a little more, uh, I'd like to ask you some questions because you know you and I come from 
two different worlds. You come from the world of science where everything needs to be measured, documented, verified, falsified, the whole works, the scientific method, experimentation, theory, observation, validation, or uh, falsification. Um, and I see that, you know, as even right now in my work and the research we're doing at the Chopra Center and the Chopra Foundation, we are looking at neurotech and we are looking at brain waves and we're looking at, you know, how they can be modulated through technologies such as ultrasound, cranial ultrasound, transmagnetic um, simulation, uh, biofeedback, all of that. So I, I'm very familiar with that and I see a great future uh, with that. But we've also been during COVID especially and um, the last uh, couple of years, we've been looking at our foundation at, at data, looking at who gets sick and who doesn't get sick with even COVID or other chronic illnesses. We've been looking at vagal stimulation, uh, which counters sympathetic overdrive, et cetera, et cetera. But two or three things that, you know, we've now sort of are very sure hold true uh, because they're not coming from me, but from good valid research and colleagues like Rudy Tanzi, who I just spoke to and last interview was with Rudy. So I'll send you that. Okay. And I'll send you, um, I'll send him your interview. Okay. But, you know, he, Hi, Rudy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. I'll send him this. So Rudy has convinced me now that less than 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant in that they guarantee the disease. So of the, say, 40 or 50 Alzheimer's gene mutations, only three are fully penetrant. Uh, of the hundreds of uh, cancer mutations, only a few, less than 5% are fully penetrant. Somebody has a Baraka gene for breast cancer, they'll get it. But the rest is related to our, uh, to our lifestyle, which includes, of course, emotional well-being, um, um, emotional resilience, but other things also sleep and exercise and diet and you know diet suddenly now is becoming very interesting because 80 percent of our serotonin comes from the gut apparently uh, through the microbiome so where are emotions in the head in the gut it's getting pretty complicated but as part of that what we did discover in our meta-analysis looking at all the literature is that almost every chronic illness except the fully penetrant genes was preceded sometimes by decades with either anxiety or, or some kind of stress or depression, uh, some kind of emotional threat. So you can say it could be sometimes even low-grade anxiety. People didn't know they had it, but they had what they call free-floating anxiety, maybe fear of old age, death, infirmity, or they had uh, existential depression, or they had depression for other reasons. They also had low-grade inflammation, and they were predisposed to chronic illness by decades, by decades. And then along with this, we did other studies where we look at the so-called uh, life-affirming emotions, like compassion, like empathy, like gratitude, like joy, um, like uh, equanimity. And we discovered very interestingly that when people kept even something simple like a gratitude journal at night, we had a group of patients uh, who had chronic heart failure. They were on drugs. We had another group of patients, chronic heart failure, on drugs as well, uh, digoxin, whatever. But they kept a gratitude journal at the same time at night. They asked themselves, what am I grateful for today? And they just wrote the answers. And inflammatory markers went down. The patients with the gratitude journal did far better than the controls who only did uh, um, uh, the, um, the medication. So now we are thinking that in a way, it's, it's actually maybe irrelevant even to talk of emotions as either biological states or states in consciousness, it's all one phenomenon, whether it's 
emotions or thoughts or biological responses. And the subtler levels start with mental issues before they actually surface as an inflammatory marker or as sympathetic overdrive or as whatever. And that's where we are going. So while we're looking at these new technologies, neural stimulation, vagal stimulation, changing the microbiome, the whole idea of practicing mindfulness where you can be aware of an emotion without actually being affected by an emotion. The awareness of an emotion is not the emotion. The awareness of an emotion is intrinsically free of the emotion. So do you see a value in these techniques of mindfulness or just the fact that I'm able to observe my emotions there's something that is independent or free. Now in Eastern wisdom traditions, that something is not the mind, that something is not the emotions, that something is not sensations or perception, that something is just simple awareness. And awareness, at least in humans, and how we've evolved, we can have an awareness of an experience, whether it's an emotion or a perception without identifying with it. And we find that that works actually in decreasing inflammation and the biological correlates of that. Any comments? Well, you said a lot. <laughs> uh, let me start by saying, yeah, de definitely one of the themes of the book is that this is all interconnected. So you were saying that the thoughts, your, your bodily feelings, your bodily state, uh, uh, your your conscious mind, everything is interconnected, and, and and it isn't really right in a way to separate emotion from the other. That's one of the points, and in fact, that's, we didn't mention it, but I talk in the book about something called core affect. I did read that, yes. Yeah, and that's kind of a proto emotion on a more fundamental level that's not as differentiated at all as discussed because there's some bad food or fear of a beer or something. It's just a general feeling that comes from the inputs of your bodily inputs that, that may be positive or negative and tell you whether something is, everything's okay or not. So, so that, that even kind the of. Core, if a, even the core affect is a conditioned mind, is there an awareness that is totally independent? Of course, in spiritual traditions, we call it your consciousness or the spirit. Maybe, but you know when we use well, I like when you when you said you don't even have to be able to name it because yeah. that's also one of the trends in modern emotion theory is that our names are take them with more of a grain of salt and that you can't really separate fear is there's just not there's not just one thing called fear there's different fears of different things actually have different processes in your head and they're different so it's not really right to just call the fear is an emotion or uh to, to say that fear and anxiety have a a, 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 a sharp line between them. Today, would people think of them as kind of uh, useful categories to talk about, but don't take them that literally. And what you said about, you know, I know you've been uh, advocating this for many years, and now science is catching up with it, I think, because you're talking about the use of mindfulness and of meditation and the um, um, gratitude exercise. And, and yeah, I do talk about that a little bit in the book, especially uh, at the end when I talk about motion regulation. Uh, that that is a very effective way of dealing with when you when you feel that you have your emotions are going out of control and you have an excess of some negative emotion. Those are a very effective ways of of dealing with it. And we know that overall, feeling an overabundance of negative emotions such as anxiety is correlated to a shorter lifespan. Uh, in fact, having too little anxiety is also correlated, by the way, to a shorter lifespan. Because you know, if you're not the kind of person who who goes to the doctor when you see a mole because you just tra la la, then you can die of skin cancer. So there's some amount of anxiety obviously serves a purpose, but too much uh, is not good. And that's just what you said. So I think that's all, all you said. I, I tend to agree with what you just said. Bottom line is always self-regulation, homeostasis. And so, yeah, too much of a good thing is not good. And too much of a bad thing is definitely bad. <laughs> too little of a bad thing is also not good. My very special guest, has been Leonard Millard now, emotional, how feelings shape our thinking. Leonard, in one sentence or one minute, 
what is your hope uh, for readers who read this book? What will they benefit? How will they? Well, I hope that they'll get a boost in their emotional intelligence, their understanding of uh, their own decisions and feelings and thoughts and how emotions uh, play in. And that also are more sensitive to other people and how emotions are affecting them. And studies have shown that people who, who do understand that better tend to thrive. They do better in their work. They do better in their personal life. And it's a very important part, I think, of knowing yourself and of really optimizing your own um, actions is, is understanding how you think and, and that the role of, of feelings in that. Thank you, Leonard. I think emotional well-being is the key to everything, including health, but also the prevention of wars and terrorism and all the havoc we're seeing in the world right now. So very happy to have you. And uh, I'll share this with Rudy and I'll send you Rudy's interview and perhaps we can follow up soon. That'll be fun. Yeah, and hope we talk again soon and uh, look forward to intersecting in some city together now that we're traveling again. Absolutely. Thank you very much.